Peter chapter 3. We shall read from verses 13. Verses 13 tonight, from verses 13 to verse 19. All right? Verses 13, sorry, to verse 20. 13 to 20, reading. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in christ for it is better if the will of god be so that ye suffer for well doing than for evil doing for christ also hath one suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us all turn to God in prayer. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great privilege to be found in thine house. Lord, you have protected us, you have kept us, you have provided for us, Lord, all so that we can be here to learn that we may know how to live in this world, in these perilous times, as strangers and pilgrims on earth, for your name. And Lord, we do pray that you would once again be merciful to cleanse us and wash us thoroughly of all our sins. Lord, we pray that you keep showing us wherein we have sinned against you, against men, that we may constantly live in sensitive repentance. And Lord, to have clean hands and pure hearts before you always. And Lord, remove every distraction, tiredness of the body, and help us, O Lord, to grow in knowing your word and grow in spirit. And Father, we pray for the Youth 180 facilitators. Use them to feed your children as well. Lord, may the young ones learn much that their lives will also be transformed. Be in thine house tonight to bless with your word. May your spirit be our teacher. May your spirit work in us both the will and the ability to do what we learn. And Father, we pray for your blessings. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a quick revision. Actually, maybe I'll ask you, what is the key thing that we learned last week that we realized we must change as strangers and pilgrims on this earth? All right, Thomas, do you remember? What's the key thing that we learned last week? We shouldn't base our decisions on money. This prayer meeting. <laughs> right. Right. So, so um, yeah, look at, look, at the, look at it. Shane. Very good. All right. Uh, Thomas, did you hear it? All right. What is it? Very good. Now, if we don't remember anything, then how is our life as strangers and pilgrims going to make any impact in this world, right? So it must not be just hate knowledge and passing the time. Now, last week, one of the key things that we learned, look at chapter 3. Chapter 3. Now, God says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We only learned one verse. How can you forget? 
Now, as strangers and pilgrims on earth, and that is the key theme of Peter thus far, one of the things that the Christian on earth must be able to do at any time, look at verse 15, at any time, in other words, be ready, always, in any situation, asked by any person, every man, whoever it is, for whatever reason they're asking you, God says, be ready always to give an answer. The word ready to give an answer is where we get apologia, the Greek word where we get the English word apologetics. Apologetics, defending the truth, being able to make the truth explain, be explained clearly. That is not only for full-time workers. That is only not, that's not only for Bible college students. That's not just for the pastors or the church leaders. Here it is written to the congregation. Every single Christian must be ready to defend the truth, ready to explain, explain your hope, your faith, why you believe and practice certain things. We live in a time, Christians, if you cannot do that, especially in our times, then you are a waste of space on earth. Because God says, if the tree does not bear any fruit, does not bring any usefulness, it is a waste of space in the ground. So every Christian must realize, I'm not saved, well, to attend a sound church, that's important, to constantly study the Word of God, that's important, and that's the end of all things. Well, maybe some go a bit further, so that I can teach my family. That's important too. But at the end of the day, why do you want to teach your family? Because your child must be able to give an answer. Because when your child asks you, you must be able to give an answer. Because as a single, when you live in this world, you must be able to give an answer. Why, why don't you just get married to anybody? Every single Christian must not think, I'm just safe and I'll just go on in my own ways. I really hope I, I feel like preaching another message on this tonight because I do not know what the next generation of BPCWA worshippers will be like. Now, if we just know the truth and whenever people ask questions about why we practice certain things, why we believe in certain things. Why don't we listen to contemporary Christian rock music in the church? Why don't we use it? There are students that keep coming through our churches. Now, they may not ask me directly, even if I ask them, they may not say it, but they leave very soon. They may ask you, are you able to explain it? We've covered all those in significant details. When they ask you about biblical separation, why do we not work with the new evangelicals, the ecumen ecumenists, the, gospel, the social gospel? Why? Many of us, we just roughly know, but we are not able to give them an answer. Then we are failures as strangers and pilgrims. There's no use for us here. Now, I really hope that if there's anything you remember from last week is I cannot be someone who, when questions are asked, I quietly sneak away and avoid answering them. I'm not saying doing it with pride, doing it with holier-than-thou attitude. That is why the reminder is meekness and fear. So please, if you are not like that, your child will never be like that. If you are not like that, the other singles, they look at you. They will also not be people that would explain God's word, defend it. God's word. What good is a church? Somehow the Lord's leading is, it seems to be a theme on being witnesses. All right, on Sunday, we stopped at, the we, we were at that passage, and here we are at the same kind of reminders. The Christian must be able to give a reason for your hope. Why don't you partake of this? Why don't you dress like that? Why do your church believe in this and that? 
All right, so please don't just be Christians who have knowledge and no use to God. All right, so I hope that we do remember that in the workplace. Now, you've learned so much from God's Word by God's grace. You take FEBC courses. When they talk about certain things, cults, when they talk about the ecumenical movement, when they talk about why Christians should not, why shouldn't Christians, why can't Christians divorce? Why can't Christians marry unbelievers? When they talk about all this, are you able to help them at all? And especially to unbelievers. All right? So, aim to be such a person. Aim to be such a stranger and pilgrim on earth. Now, then we move on, okay? Number 16 and 17. Now, God says, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you of your good conversation in Christ. Now, it is often believed from historical records written by both um, unbelievers and believers that Nero, the emperor at that time, falsely accused the Christians of a great fire in Rome that burnt down a great part of the, of the city. Right? The belief is he wanted to make some changes or he was just um, doing it for fun. Nobody really knows. But many recorded that the Christians were the one that were the scapegoat for the fire that consumed a great part of the city. Some said that because he wanted to renew certain parts of the city, he didn't like the slums or, and, and all that. He just, well, just burn it down and let the people die there. Who cares? Some said he did it just for fun. We don't know. But we know one thing. Well, very closely tied to this passage, I believe this is what Peter was probably writing about. These Christians were severely persecuted for the faith. Now, they, the Christians were preaching about a new kingdom that will come. They were giving an answer for their faith. Speaking of a king that will come, that will return. Now, of course, this would be a great answer that, answer that um, Nero would not like to hear. As we live in this world, there will be many things about the gospel that the world would not want to hear. Hear about one day Christ will come back, and in the battle of Armageddon, he will destroy the face of the earth, and eventually create a new heaven and new earth, they are trying to save the earth. Things like that in the Bible are things that they do not like to hear. They hate it. Now, and for him, this must be a people that must be killed, removed. It is said, as I've mentioned a few times, he would torture them, he would accuse them because of that. Well, you are the one who caused the fire in the city. You are very disobedient people. You talk about a, a ruler that will come and take over this place. You are terrible people. And then you decided to burn down the city. So he would, he would put animal, he would kill animals, put animal skins on, on them and release lions. So the lions would smell the flesh and the lions would eat these dead animals that were put over the Christian's body, he do it for sport. He would torture them with unspeakable things that he invented. Then at the end of the day, some are still half alive or some are well alive. He would use them as firebrands to light up his evening parties. That is what he does accusing the Christians for something they did not do, and then torturing them, persecuting them severely. Now, here Paul say, uh, Peter says, now having a good conscience, whereas they, acu they accuse you, falsely accuse you. Good conscience. Now, ask in question number one, 
Remembering that they, these Christians, are under tremendous persecution, how is it possible for them to feel and act as God told them to? Now, God told them to give, uh, to be ready to give an answer. God told them to be ready to suffer for righteousness. Now, how would they be able to go through that? Well, one of the things here God says is this. Have a good conscience. What is conscience? Conscience is that which is in us, that God put in men to be able to tell what is morally right and wrong, good and evil. Now, of course, for the Christian's conscience is what God says is evil, what God says is good, what God says is wrong or right, right? That is our conscience after salvation. Because for the unbelievers, yes, they still have conscience that God put in them, but many of the conscience are today severely marred and distorted. All right, to them, evil is good, good is evil. So their conscience is op the opposite. People who need to be locked up, and even in Christianity today, we just read about cover-ups in Hillsong Ministries of the founder, what he did. Not just what the founder's father did, but just today I read about what he did. His so-called indiscretions. The conscience today is love. We must show love and cover it up. Show love. Now, any form of abuse, any form of um, adulteries like that must be disciplined, must be dealt with rightly. But the conscience, even in Christians today, are distorted. It's a distorted kind of love. Now, remember when we learned about obedience to your own husbands, we said very clearly that any kind of abuse, emotional or physical, on the wife, the church will not hesitate to report. You are always supposed to protect your wife, not abuse them. That it will not only be church discipline and then we cover it up, no. Anything that needs to be reported, anything that is criminal, whatever, whoever you are, the conscience is we must do what is right in God's eyes according to the, and what is according to the law in the land as well. All right? We, are, we have no right to do that. Cover it up. Well, back to this, conscience. So God says, well, they will accuse you falsely. Now, the most difficult thing to bear in life is false accusation, isn't it? There is a desire to retaliate, to do evil in return. But God says, well, answer them with meekness and in fear, having a good conscience. You see, when you and I have a good conscience, it enables us to bear persecution. Whether it is at work, in school, at home, among friends, conscience is critical. Because maybe I would ask you, why is it that God says, now you make sure that you have a good conscience. That is what is going to help you through. Why is conscience so crucial? Um, Han, why do you think so? Why God says, make sure you have a good conscience that when you're going through this, you'll be all right. Why do you think so? Our, our conscience will dictate our choices we make. Is that what you said? I didn't get that. Sorry. Okay, yeah, our conscience dictates a lot of our actions um, that we take. Yes, it's linked. Now, as long as you have a good conscience, if conscience dictates what you do, well, you won't change your mind, right? You keep going on. It enables you to keep going on. Well, my conscience does not allow me to do otherwise, so I will keep 
enduring the persecution. Yes, that's true. That's true. Now, the other thing is, now look at verse 15. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, right? Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. It means make God of highest priority and God is the only thing that matters. Not what man says or think or what man thinks about you even. Sanctify means set God high, highly aside in your heart. And when you do so, and you have a good conscience, means you know, now, I have not done any evil. And what they said about me, I did not do it at all. Or if I did something, and that is the right thing by God, or even by the country, that is the right thing. And they bring me to others, and they falsely accuse me. Now, because I sanctify God in my heart, all that matters is what God knows, what God thinks. As long as my conscience is right before God, whom I highly sanctify in my heart, not only will I be able to continue, it will not cause me to break down. You know, when we sanctify men in our hearts, we are very upset because of two things. One is the person has a wrong idea about you. So you get trouble. And you may even compromise just to give a good impression. Now, the second thing is when we sanctify men in our hearts. Our pride is very important, our face. We get so troubled, upset, when we think that I should have been praised. I should have been rewarded. Not falsely accused. And we can't bear it. You see, a conscience, a good conscience. Now look at verse 16. Having a good conscience. Not any conscience, but a good one before God. Will make you just lie in bed and say, well, they can falsely accuse me at work, at home, or my relatives do that. I can sleep. I can go through it. Right? Now, like I said, the example of Peter himself. Peter is not writing from a vacuum without experience. Remember the example. Peter was sleeping when the angels came to release him. He was a very different Peter. Peter used to be someone who was very proud, always wanted to be the head of the pact, wants to be praised. But this time he was in prison for his faith, for, for, for nothing that he has done wrong. He did not just get so upset. How, how can they think this of me? Now, what would the church think of me now? I'm Peter, you know, nothing. He had a good conscience. He could just sleep. And that imprisonment, many believe, could have been his final imprisonment, right? They wanted, they were plotting to kill him. So Christians, how? How are we able to go through this world as strangers and pilgrims? Later on, we'll talk about some examples of difficult situations. Is to have a good conscience, right? A good con You can only have a good conscience if you know God's word. Because you can have the wrong conscience, not a good one, all right? You follow the world's conscience. So that's one, that's one. Now, what is the other one? How is it possible? Now, it is found in verse 17. For it is better if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For it is better if the will of God be so. The second thing that will help you through this, not only having a good conscience, but sometimes having a good conscience, you feel, but God, why? I know I didn't do anything wrong, but God, why? So, so God says, if the will of God be so. Remember, this part is about submission, right? The strangers and pilgrims' submission. Submit to the will of God. Knowing that God is always in control, no, it's so easy for us to say, right? God is always in control. Think about them. They just saw their father eaten up by lions. 
their children burnt on the stick, used as torchlights. They see this, and yet, for them to be able to accept, for it is better, how can it be better? How can it be better, Lord, to see this? I mean, think of the Ukrainians who see the great atrocities, injustice done to their people, to their relatives. And then you tell them, if the will of God be so, you tell the Christian there. So don't read these words and take them lightly. If the will of God be so, I think there is nothing that the Christian is going through now that can be compared to what they are going through. I think we can quite safely say that. So for us to accept the will of God, if he allows injustices at the workplace, if he allows unfair treatment towards you by even loved ones, close people. Now God says, God has allowed it. He intended it to be so in your life for a reason, for his glory and for your growth, always that. So when you think about it, if the will of God be so, you're frustrated, you're upset, and you're suffering. You got fired. You got sacked. Some of the very young ones among us here. Your friends say, I won't talk to you. They falsely accuse you. Now, I remember when I was in, in very young in primary school, there was, there was a, a student, very intelligent student. He went on to be a president scholar in the country, very intelligent student. But he's very meek, very quiet, physically quite weak. And he was always bullied. He was always bullied. And I remembered once he was sitting in front of me and he didn't do anything. But well, other students are jealous of him and see that it's easy to bully, good to bully. Now keep bullying him, keep throwing things at him, um, making funny noises. And then when the teacher said, who did that? The students behind pointed at him and he got punished. He got punished. And he just took it quietly. All right, I saw that and I was quite distressed. Um, I still remember it so clearly today. I should have spoken up, I guess. I didn't do anything. Well, here, if the will of God be so and you suffer. Right, students, young, very young ones, you may go through that. Well, at workplace, we answer some of that in question number two. The will of God. The will of God. God is not blind. God is not without control. When your boss does something to you, when your colleague does something to you, or relatives, it did not happen without God's knowing, without God's allowing. So that is the second one, all right? And the third one from here, he continues, all right? So you see two fours, right? Now, verse 16, he says, having a good conscience. Then verse 17, he says, for it is better. Then verse 18, he says, for Christ has suffered. So the next four, the next thing that will help you to go through all this, just because you're a Christian, is for Christ, in verse 18, has suffered once, have, have, have also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, you see here again. Now, Christians, some people take this verse and they say, for Christ hath also once suffered for sins. And they say, you see, God, Jesus is not God. Jesus suffered for sins. They just quote one part of the verse and they say, Jesus suffered for sins. So Jesus went to hell as well, all right? Which is the next part we're going to talk about. Did Jesus go to hell? So Jesus suffered for sins. It cannot be. Jesus is the spotless lamb. He bore your sins. How do we know? In verse 18, it says, the just for the unjust. He is the just ones, just one, the pure, the sinless, without any need for justification. It is his suffering. It is for the unjust, us. Now, so the third thing 
And it says, that he might bring us to God. That he might bring us to God. The third thing that will help you and I through all this is to turn our eyes away from ourselves like Christ and turn to what? Others. Their, their, their souls. No matter how they persecute you, it cannot be worse than what they did to Christ. No matter how unjust they are, Yet God says he bore all this. Now for what? That he might bring us to God. That is why Christ suffered meekly before men, meek as a lamb to the slaughter. That is why he had a good conscience. He was the just one. He did all so that others would come to know his father, would be saved, would know the gospel. Now, when you and I are treated unjustly, why do we get upset? Because we feel that we have been treated unjustly, then think the just for the unjust, so that they can come to know God. God has put me in this place of work. He allowed this to happen. I must respond rightly. By my response, look at verse, chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, chapter 2, verse 12. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Whether it's God visiting them in salvation or the day of judgment, they still have to acknowledge you are right. But here God says, accept his will. It is, what if it is so that someone through your responses would come to know God? Would, are you willing to suffer for that? If you always think of my testimony is at stake because of how they will think about God. In other words, it's always about their soul. God says, you'll be able to bear it. If you're a believer, if you're not a believer, you think all this is ridiculous, right? Paul said, I suffered much. I suffered many things. Why? For the sake of the elect. He said, there are those that God intends to save. There are those that God will save. And I will suffer much for them. All right, so three reasons. Conscience, the will of God, submission to the will of God. And for the sake of souls, be willing to bear all things. All right? That is the part about how can I obey such a commandment. command. Now, question number two then. Now we come to the practical part. Now give examples of how Christians can be accused of being evil doers, and how should we respond and why would they become ashamed? Because here God says, all right, in verse 16, whereas they speak evil of you as of evil doers, they may be ashamed. They may be ashamed that falsely accuse you Accuse your good conversation in Christ. Now, actually, before that, let me ask. Why do you want them to be ashamed? Or what is this ashamed about? What do you think it is? Yen Wei, welcome to Vijan. Yen Wei. Why do you think, all right, your, your colleague did, does something very terrible to you, all right, and you don't retaliate. In fact, you, you respond rightly as a Christian. Why? Because you want them to be ashamed. The boss will find out and then one day the boss will scold them and then I get vindicated. And shame, shame, shame on you. Why? You want them to be ashamed because you want them to know Christ. Alright? Yes? How? Alright? Look at how God puts it. They falsely accuse you of your good 
conversation. Now, good life, good lifestyle, good, li good um, testimony, all right? Conversation in Christ. Not just simply good in your own self, in your own right. Your good conversation in Christ. They relate your behaviors to being a Christian. Your conversation is in Christ. They know about it. All right, so you want them to be ashamed? Don't read it as, yes, I want to get back to them and what, whatever evil they do, I will expose them. Yes, and I'm vindicated, I'm right. They are wrong. They were wrong. So now, sh the, when they get caught, they'll be ashamed. Not that, right? The purpose is always, chapter 2, verse, verse 12, it is that they will glorify God. In other words, they will come to the conclusion that they were wrong about you, not about you. They were wrong about your God because they relate your, your, your behavior to Christ. And then if you keep doing the right thing, giving, explaining to them, giving an answer of your hope, now they will begin to realize Looks like I misunderstood Christianity. Looks like I misunderstood this Christ of my friend. Looks like their, their truth makes a lot more sense than my truth. How foolish. I need to know more about this God. All right? Well, of course, on the day of judgment, if the day of um, visitation of God is the day of judgment, yes, they will be ashamed. They will bow before Christ and they will be ashamed. But for the living, that is what we are aiming for, all right? Now, this is a motivation. Not only that the, the Christian, you must be ready to give an answer. Because your answer, how well you can answer will put them to shame. When I say put them to shame, you know what I mean. When we are not able to give an answer, we shame Christ instead. They will think, see, my understanding of what Christianity is teaching is right. You can't defend it. Of course, there'll be cases where they won't accept it. I'm not saying that you must defend until they're accepted. There are, there are times that they will never accept. But when the Christian cannot give an answer, you cannot fulfill this. All right? Okay, so now, how should we respond? And then how, why would they be ashamed? Okay, so you understand what ashamed means and what is the objective now give examples. What are examples? Perhaps I ask you, what are the big umbrellas you should consider? Howard, of examples. Yeah, very good. Always look at the Bible, right? The answer is there. You Do you understand my question? My question is, once a Christian says, I have to think of examples. What are the areas of my life? Which areas would you think of? Yeah, all right, your testimony where? As a? Say again? In the workplace, all right, good. Next one, um, uh, uh, Alex. All right, in the church, okay. Um, Digan Yujin, uh, Adrian. At home, all right. Now, we struggle a bit. It is quite easy when you just follow scriptures and you do get the answer. Now, look at where we are. It's about strangers and pilgrims and submission, submission so that they have no evil to speak against you, right? You did not do anything wrong. So, look at chapter 2, verse 13. 13 to 17 is, is what? About the life of a citizen in the country. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of men for the Lord's sake, right? So, and it says, verse 15, for it is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men in the country by your submission to the country laws, right? So in the country, as citizens. You see, when you do not follow the scriptures, then you will not think about, well, I actually need to have a good testimony as a citizen. 
Because naturally, we just gravitate to work. Yes, work. That is correct. Verses 18, all right? Verses 18 um, to 20, 18 to 20. Servants, be subject to your own masters, to your masters with all fear, not only to... Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward, right? So, the workplace, that is where persecution can occur. Then, chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, or 1 to 7, chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. In the home, right? Likewise, you wives, be subject unto your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. You see, to unbelieving husbands submission to unbelieving husbands is difficult they may be unreasonable right so in the home you may be persecuted for your christian faith and then the Christ, the family model right the relationship between the husband and the wife how it should be when you obey the model the christian family model they will ridicule you they may even make life very difficult for you to live that Christian life, right? That Christian family model. And then, yes, among, among believers, verses 8, or, or just general among believers, unbelievers, verses 8 to, um, 8 to 13, for example. So all these aspects. Now, just then, just use these areas. You can think of other areas, but how do you think like, the, how do you think Christians today in society can be persecuted and we need to be ready to give an answer we need to have a good conscience we need to live rightly so that they will be ashamed and they will come to acknowledge god they come to know god how all right maybe in the country young persecution i think we don't suffer persecution all right we can hardly use that word but being falsely accused Uh, we begin with, with we, we follow the sequence in God's word. The first, the first place was society. Um, any individuals or group of Christians? Maybe individuals first. All right, so, for example, but there's a workplace, <laughs> all right? You seldom go out. Just think of our situation. All right, so we'll just jump to the workplace first, all right? So the example is, well, even Christ, well, unbelievers will, will accuse me of um, not being as hardworking as, as them, and uh, I'm, I go to church, so I leave on time on certain days i go to church and even christians accuse me no you shouldn't leave you should stay back and and work late with them is it a lot of politics going on and all that and even christians will accuse you yeah you see you're not hard working now if you're really not hard working all right because it must be a good conscience for your well doing all right means so the assumption is that you finish your work properly, you fulfill your responsibilities well, and then you, no one can fault you. And yet, Christians will say, no, Christians should not be so regular. And be more regular at work over time. All the activities that, that goes on in school, volunteer, participate. Why keep going for Bible studies? Why go for Saturday activities in church? That kind of thing, is it? Similar. Yeah, all right. Then, yes, you will face that. Falsely, falsely accuse you. And if in your conscience, 
you're right, you're right. All right? Are you going to compromise and say, all right, I think then I better sign up for more ECAs, but that means I will not be able to go for prayer meetings or um, may even affect my Sunday worship. So yes, one example, what about country? I want us to think about country. Um, uh, Jonathan. When you have to obey God and not men, and when the country laws are wrong, um, yes, definitely, in that situation, we'll be, we'll, we'll be under persecution. But what about the opposite? You see, in verse 14, uh, chapter 2, verse 14, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him, means sent by God for the punishment of evildoers and for praise of them that do well. Means this is not the case where you're disobeying the government because they are asking you to disobey God. All right, in this situation, in this context, it's about, it's about actually obeying the government. <laughs> goody, goody, or telling on them. They, they... Now, think of COVID-19. Oh, I see Alex nodding. He said, yes, Alex, you have something urgent to say. Anti-vaxxers, what do they say about you? Right? You go for vaccination, you obey the government, and then they mock you. Right? You wear a mask outside. I guess it's not so prominent in Perth, but I hear in some places they're very aggressive if you wear a mask. I read about a mother who she realized that, well, the vaccination would help, would have prevented her child from becoming a lot worse and the child was suffering quite badly. She was an anti-vaxxer, and then when she realized that, she came to her senses and said, it makes sense, all right? What the government is doing is for protection and for the good of the citizens. Um, and all of a sudden, everybody started to attack her, all right? You want to do what is good, what is right, and what the government wants, and some, when you sign in, all right? They don't want you to sign in, all right? They, they, mock you and all that. So even as you obey, be a good citizen. Right? The last thing we should do is join them. Now, if you personally have a problem with it, you keep it to yourself, if for whatever reason. I don't see why the Christians should join people and go against what government asks you to do when, it is, when they are not sinful things, all right? So I think this is one example. Anyone can think of others? Uh, you, can, you can move to work if you want. All right. Now, you may have unbelieving relatives who get very upset at you for going to church. And they say, well, you know, it's not safe now. Um, why are you going? Why are you bringing the children? You should not. Stay at home. Just stay at home and do online whatever you do in church. Yeah, they will be upset. They will make life very difficult at home. Maybe grandparents, unbelieving grandparents. Now, the worst is when it's Christians, right? The worst is when it is, there are Christians who, who mock you, who try to bring fear upon you and all that. All right, so just some examples. Now, obeying masters, like I said, some on Sunday, I think some of you experience as well. Well, to be a Christian. Now, do good, to do good. I remember a Christian who had to do, who would always do what is right. And when there was a contract to be renewed with a customer, it was a money losing contract. All right? But this Christian still made sure that he, that he followed everything by the book, informed the customer it's time to renew. That is what they are expected to do. So inform the customer, always do what is just, what is right. 
And then was falsely accused that this Christian was collaborating with the customer. It's a money losing business for the company. So this Christian, this person is collaborating with the customer. I think he is getting some kickback from the customer. Why would anyone want to renew such a contract? All right. But the Christian was simply just following the books to do what is right. Um, and the person was subject to company investigation and all sorts of things. But a good conscience. You see, when you're a good conscience, there's no fear. There's no worries. There's no ang- then the Christian should not be angry. Because, they, well, it's the will of God. The Christian just accepted it's the will of God. Why did this happen? I was just doing the right thing. Well, God has a reason. And actually, at the end of it, God had a very good reason. All right? I won't share the rest of the story, but God had a very good reason. And he learned. But he just simply responded rightly. Responded rightly. Did everything in the investigation without, with meekness and fear towards God. No retaliation. And because of that, because of that, the investigation, investigator said, you know, it was so clear. You, you were not hiding anything. You know, from the facts, yes, it looks all very, very... Um, the accusations doesn't look good for you and looks, looks like you were wrong. But the fact that... So when it was investigation, the person just said, well, give us, the, give us your emails. And the Christian just said, well, whatever you want. You log in and take whatever you want. No retaliation, no anger. You see, when we are falsely accused, God says, give your answer a reason of your hope with meekness and fear and say, continue to respond. Means your, your conversation, continue to make sure your conversation is good. Your responses are good. Continue in that. And because of that, they said to him, you know, we found that you had nothing to hide and you were so cooperative and you were not... Um, um, trying to attack the person in return and all that, you was always just always doing what is right. And so it's so clear that there's no nothing in this case at all. And the fact, and eventually they said, yeah, you were doing everything you were supposed to do. And the Christian said, well, after that, whenever the person who accused him walked past him, they not look at him. All right? But the Christian continued to smile and greet him, but the person just looked away. Now, this person is known to be a Christian. Hopefully, they are the person one day. Now, in his shame, would realize, how could I do that? And I really see that Christians are different, right? Workplace. It can be other things that you can think of. Masters. In the home as well, right? Christian mothers. When you give up your job to look after your child at home, the world mocks you. The world mocks you. Why do you do that? Why do, you mean you submit to your husband? Yes, Scripture says, subject to your own husbands, even to unbelieving husbands. Anything that is not sinful, you submit and you obey. How can you do that? You bring shame to the, to the female gender. It's people like you that cause family abuses, women abuses. It's people like you that, and so on, and so on, and so on. All right? Even when, when, when they meet up with you for coffee, they, they look down on you for obeying God. Right? So all sorts of situations where the Christian can go through um, false accusations. You are just obeying God. You are just doing what is right. Now, anyone have experienced something that, they, that you want to say and help other Christians realize, yes, I get false accusation and how the Lord helped me through it. Anyone? No one? Life is good, right? Life is very good, and there's a question for people like us at the end. <laughs> well, life is so good. All right, so now even in the home where you have unbelieving or even believing Christians, they may be from the ecumenical movement or Roman Catholics or charismatics, and then you go to a sound church and you practice what you believe and they make life very difficult and they 
they accuse you, they falsely accuse you, they say that you are, you are cult, you are extremist and all sorts of things. How it must be very difficult because day in and day out you have to face that. Hmm? But God simply says, be ready to give every man, including your family members, an answer for the uh, reason for your hope and continue in your good conversation. Now, hopefully one day they would realize, they would realize that you were right. And there are many cases like that among Christians. One day they realize and they leave the charismatic movement, for example. All right, so Christian respond, respond right. Now, question number three, all right? So now we move quickly. Question number three. Now here, just some theological um, answers that the Christian must be clear about. Question number three. Now, let's look at verse eight. Now, verse 18, verse 18. It says, um, but, but quickened by the Spirit means given life, means resurrection. All right, the context is talking about resurrection, like in verse 21, by the resurrection of Christ. So the context is resurrection. Now, who raised Christ from the dead? Who raised Christ from the dead? Sing Yun. Sing Yun. Who raised Christ from the dead? God the Father. But here, what about God the Spirit? Over here it says God the Spirit, right? Why do you say God the Father? Because what? Sorry? When he died, he commit his spirit to the Father. He just committed his spirit to the Father. He didn't say that the Father raised his body. This has to do with body, right? Look at verse 18. They might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh. So he's talking about the body. Is it the spirit? What about the Father, Vincent? Not sure, but definitely the Spirit, right? Now, let us turn to John, um, let's first turn to John 10, 18. Uh, let's turn to Romans 6, 4, right? Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Right, reading together. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we should walk in newness of life. So the Father is involved in raising Christ from the dead. Look at John 10 verse 18. John 10 verse 18. Right, quickly. John 10 verse 18. Reading, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So Christ himself said, I lay down my life, and I have the power to take it up myself. All right, so when we read scriptures, we have to know the Father, the Holy Spirit, as we read in First Peter, and the Son himself are involved in the resurrection, okay? Just to make sure that we understand this truth. Actually, more importantly is that Christ, not just the Spirit, because some here read, you say, and the reason I want to explain this is some say, well, he's quickened by the Spirit. He was raised by the Spirit. You see, Jesus was not God. The Holy Spirit of God needed to raise this flesh of his we have to remember that christ himself said it's not just the spirit yes the spirit was involved but he said i have the power to lay it down i have the power to take it up so christ himself raised himself he's god any one of you can raise yourself after you die none of us because we are human okay so that's why i want us to be clear about that now let's move quickly to the next question 
Uh, this is the one that is constantly asked, and I know some of you are, know it very well already because you went through Westminster Confession of Faith. Now, question number four. From verses, chapter 3, verses 18 to 20, explain whether Christ went to hell to preach to, to, preach to sorry, the souls there after his resurrection. Because look at verse 18. Now, it says, verse 18 says, well, he died, and, well, the Spirit resurrected him. Verse 19, then it says, by which he, he, which is Christ, went and preached unto the spirits in prison. See, there is always this idea that Christ went to hell to preach to souls there. And a few errors comes, come out of it. A few errors come out of it, and we have to be very clear and not give the wrong answer when people ask about our faith. Now, question number one is, did Christ go to hell to preach to souls? Were there souls that were in, or not hell, a limbo place called paradise? They were limbo there, and then Christ went there to release these souls. Okay, so there are two ideas that Christian very often are confused about and they have because of this passage. One, that Christ went to hell. Two, that Christ went to release souls from a place where souls are kept in prison. Okay, so is this the case? Because it sure sounds like it. By the which he, which is the context is talking about Christ, went and preached unto spirits in prison. So they say when Christ died in the flesh, he went to some place, and then the spirit, after that, after he's done his job there, was resurrected by the spirit. Now, what is this passage about? Okay, maybe I'll ask very quickly, um, Kelvin. Kelvin? Yes. Did Christ go to a place to preach to souls, for example, in hell. Christ went to hell to preach to the souls. Say again? Not what? Oh, not sure. Not sure or no, he didn't. No, he didn't. Then how do you explain this? He went, he definitely went to preach to the spirits in prison, for sure. And when you just read it like that, oh, after he died, he went to somewhere to preach to certain people in prison. Probably after that, release them. Nathan. Nathan, is it? Nathan, yes. Say again. Oh, not sure. Okay, ask Daddy. Jonathan. <laughs> Physical prison? Not hell, but physical prison. But why would they mention Christ going to a physical prison to preach? When I was in prison, you gave me water to drink. <laughs> when I was thirsty, you gave me water to drink. So I was in prison, I was thirsty. Okay, last one. Howard, you should know. You went through Westminster Confession. Can't remember. Ah, I want that answer, right? I want that answer because uh, let's look at verse 15 and be ready always to give an answer to every man, even your pastor, <laughs> that asketh you a reason why you don't believe that Christ went to hell or he went to release some souls to go to heaven. Okay, so you come up with a new, or both you and Jonathan come up with a new theory that after the Spirit resurrected him, he went to prisons to preach to people. <laughs> All right, that's a new one. Okay, now, let's follow this carefully, all right? So please, from now onwards, have this clear in your heart because there are Christians for many years, even when I was here and whenever I visit churches, they still ask, you know, my grandma died. And I was told that she is in a place somewhere and she will be released later on, like the Old Testament people. Or some, uh, or some will believe 
that, yeah, so they, she, she is in a place. She's not in heaven. And they get very sad. They don't have a Christian hope. And then they, and you can't explain to them the hope that is in you. Then we are useless to the other Christian, right? They are discouraged. So there have been people who came out to me very discouraged. All the years as a Christian in a church, thinking that I don't know when my grandma will ever get to heaven. I say, but she's a believer, you told me. Yeah, but she needs to go somewhere first. That's what I understand from the Bible. That's what people, what, that's what Christians tell me. How are you going to encourage them? Now, of course, some would use this to justify um, the Roman Catholic doctrines as well about, about uh, purgatory. So you must know, please, once and for all, all right? Let's follow it. Verse 18. He said, now, he was put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. All right? Then he said, by which also he went and preached. So the he must be Christ. Who, who is the by which? By which refers to verse 18. He was quickened by the Spirit, by which also Christ went. Okay? So look here. So, by which he also went to preach, uh, went to preach unto spirits in prison. So there are spirits in prison. Okay. So I just draw. There are spirits. Uh, spirits must be dotted, right? Okay. Many of them. They're not holding hands, huh? I'm just saying dotted, many of them, all right? Spirits, spirits in prison. So it's somewhere, okay? Now, then scriptures are actually very clear and very simple, explaining to us very clearly and very simply. Which were, now, who is this which now? Which sometime were disobedient. So this which, this time must be the spirits that were in prison, okay, right? If you follow, please nod your head, huh? All right, okay. So now, these spirits here, these dotted ones, they were sometime, sometime, you know, in King, King James language means they were in the past, in the past, some time ago. All right, at one time, in the past, were disobedient. So you know, you know that at some time, okay, now they are solid, all right? So they are, they are living. In the past, so spirit means they are dead. Spirit means they are dead, correct? Then, there was some time, some time in the past, in time, in time, some time in the past, when they were living in their flesh, they were disobedient. So God says these were dis people disobedient in the past, now their spirit is in prison, okay? Now, when is this time? That's the question we need to answer. Now, verse 20, when once this long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, ha, huh, it is about the days of Noah. When were they disobedient? In the days of Noah. So I draw, uh, please don't take this as how Noah, Noah's ark looked like, okay? All right? This is very unlikely how Noah's ark looked like, but I'm just drawing to help you understand. All right? So it was about the Noah's time. The sometime was Noah's time. And God says, when once the long suffering of God waited in the, no, in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing. So while Noah's ark was being built, when were they, when were they in the flesh? When Noah's ark was a preparing, was being built. Now this is the situation. Now the question is this. So Noah, right? So Mr. Noah, Mr. Noah, I draw him in a different form, right? Wearing maybe some long Jewish clothes, right? Noah, and Noah was building the ark. But he says that Christ, you can't doubt. Verse 18 says, Christ, he, Christ went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So here, look up here. Now, first we know it is the spirit. The spirit which Christ used to go and preach to these people. So these people were preached to. So I will say gospel. All right, gospel. They hear the gospel. They hear about the hope that was in Noah, all right? They, heard, they keep hearing it, they keep hearing it. It was preached to them when they were alive. Sometime in the past, they were disobedient and God was very patient with them during that time. Now, the question is, who is, how did Christ go there to preach? How? How? How do you think? Now, turn to Second Peter chapter 2. Second 
2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Let's read together. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eight person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. A preacher of righteousness. Now, God called Noah a preacher of righteousness. Okay? A preacher of righteousness. Now, turn back to First Peter. We learned this already. First Peter chapter 1. Now, look at verse 11. Of verse 10, let's read 10 and 11 um, together. 10 and 11, chapter 1. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come upon, uh, unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which it testified beforehand, the uh, sorry, which was in them, the Spirit of Christ which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. You see, look, verse 10 talk about the prophets, the prophets who were looking about looking into what salvation is. Now, verse 11 say, the Spirit of Christ which was in them, the them are the, those who preach the word, the Spirit of Christ. Now, then you look at chapter 3, verse 20, uh, verse 19. Once you link that, the Spirit of Christ that was in them, verse 19, by which also Christ went and preached unto the spirits. Now, by which is by the Holy Spirit, also Christ went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So, once you piece this together, it's a very straightforward picture. Now, look up here. God says, the preacher was Noah. God says, these prophets and this preacher, they have the spirit of Christ in them. When God says that by the spirit, he went, Christ went, to preach to these disobedient ones in the past, during Noah's time. That is what it meant. Christ, through his spirit, preached to the disobedient people. Remember, I use another color. Christ, by the spirit, Christ, by the spirit, in verse 19, went to preach to the disobedient people in Noah's time. He, through the preacher, preached to them. Um, Jonathan, understand? Is it clear? Anyone has any questions so far? All right? So, look at verse 19, by which Christ also went uh, by which, sorry, by the Spirit, he also went. Just like today, when we go out and preach the gospel, we, have, we, we openly acknowledge, not by power, nor by might, but by thy Spirit alone. We know. So who is preaching to the person? When you preach the gospel, we always remind ourselves, we need to depend on the Holy Spirit. All right? And who sends the Holy Spirit? Who sends the Holy Spirit? Christ already said I send the Holy Spirit. I and the Father sends the Holy Spirit. So the roles are like that. The Holy Spirit is used by God in preaching, whether it's the Old or the New Testament, to speak to souls. That is just that. There's no limbo place. There's no, some people are waiting there in prison. Now, what is this prison? Now, look up here now. What is this prison? Now, when Peter, when Peter was writing all right, so when Peter, all right, so Peter writing, all right? Actually, they use scrolls, not like that. When Peter was writing, writing, not chair, huh? I just want to make sure you understand, especially the young ones, all right? The scroll, I guess the scrolls. When Peter was writing this, this disobedient people, all right? This disobedient people which rejected the gospel. How do we know? Because God says only eight souls were saved. Here, only eight. Noah's family. Only these were saved. These were disobedient ones. Sometime in the past. And these eight, the outside these eight, the disobedient ones are definitely dead and they are in spirit form. Their bodies are buried, of course, underwater, wherever it is on earth. But the spirit are still in prison spirit in a place 
where we know God says it's hell. It's hell. Christ did not, yes, the spirit, they are in prison. Yes. They are in prison in hell, waiting for the day of judgment. They are there, and eventually they'll be cast into the lake of fire. This is not a permanent place. Hell is not the permanent place. Revelations tell us hell, and then they are dead in hell. Their souls will all be cast into the lake of fire. This is that place. Christ did not go to, so look up here. When Peter say, now I'll just read, by the Spirit, by the Spirit, Christ went to preach to the Spirit, uh, to this the, to these spirits, all right. So they preached the same people. They were their spirit were in these bodies. They were preached to by Christ through the Spirit, and they were disobedient. And now it is described in the past they were disobedient. These were the ones, and their spirits are now in hell. So at this time, when Paul, when Peter is writing, yeah, their spirits are there. Christ, he's saying, preached to them in the past. They rejected, except eight accepted, and this the rest of them are in this place now that's all all right so don't bet don't get confused i try to draw and hopefully once and for all all right i know who to ask the next time howard and nathan all right and be ready to give an answer now this helps believers so when i explain this then the girl said oh then the 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 relief on her face and the joy on her face all these years i was so sad i still don't know when my, my grandma will will be with christ when the thief died next to him next to christ he said this day thou shalt be with me in paradise all right paradise is a wonderful place that is heaven all right god's vocabulary is not so short that he he only know one word heaven all right he describes it he's describing what heaven is a paradise he's not saying paradise is another place and people take these scriptures or oh, this maybe for christians is called paradise and then Christ, when he died, he went there and released all these souls, the Old Testament souls and all, they went to heaven. It cannot be. Well, worse, some believe he go there to preach. They are unbelievers. They are already in hell. There's no hope for redemption. Why would Christ go there and preach to these souls? All right? So all these things, Christ did not suffer for his sins and go to hell as well. Okay, so all this. Any questions? No questions. Now, actually, I would like to continue, but we need to stop here. Now, maybe I'll ask you, <laughs> this is quite theological. Now, why, why did God bring this up all of a sudden so that people can argue about this passage? Why, did, why do you think God would now suddenly bring in this? Why do you think so, Shane? I asked Shane already. Uh, Jason, Jason. Why do you think sudden, it's like kind of out of place, right? Suddenly Noah's, Noah and him preparing the ark comes into the picture. Not sure. Last person, Caleb. Yes. Do you hear that? All right? Because Peter is continuing about how the Christian life on earth, on earth will always, was always difficult before the flood. No one lived among these terrible people. And he was building an ark for which is to prepare them for a flood. And they haven't even seen or heard of rain, let alone a flood. You imagine the ridicule. You imagine the children of Noah every day building this ark with him. For how long? Ben. Say, say again. No, a few hundred. Right? For at least 100 over years, 120 years, most of the understanding is easily a century. All right? 100 years. Imagine. So he's trying to tell them, you went through, you're going through a difficult time, but think of Noah for more than a hundred years. Ridicule. And when we come back, we'll study. We want to learn from Noah's life. You, dis you learn about God's description of the people then, and then you can imagine Noah's life. Why do you think Noah is in the hall of faith? 
because of how he lived when he was under the most difficult situation for a very long time with his family, children. You must learn that as well. I think that's all we can cover tonight, but I hope that we reflect on whether we are witnesses ready to give an answer in whatever situation we are in, in society, at the workplace, in the home. Are we ready to bear persecution for the sake of souls? Let us pray.